Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We appreciate you joining us again on another CIQ webcast, uh, doing our research roundtable. And this week, we're going to be talking about Werewolf and OpenHPC, and I think we have a fairly large cast today. Have some new faces. Some we haven't seen in a while. So I'm going to go ahead and do introductions real quick, guys. I'm going to go around the screen the way that I see you. So Gary, if you don't mind introducing yourself again. My name is Gary Jung. I manage the Scientific Computing Group for Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. We manage the institutional HPC program for the laboratory. And I also wear two hats. I also run the HPC program for UC Berkeley. Thank you. Misha, first time. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Misha Ahmadiyan from uh, High Performance Computing Center of Texas Tech University. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Anderson. I am an HPC engineer with CIQ. Jeremy, welcome back. Hey there, uh, Jeremy Seidel with uh, Intel Corporation. I also represent uh, the OpenHPC project. Uh, I'm a uh, integration engineer at Intel and also the lead liaison to the uh, OpenHPC project at Intel. Outstanding, thank you. Glenn. Hi, Glenn Otero. I'm the director of scientific computing at CIQ. Greg? Hi, everybody. I'm Greg. Um, uh, open source guy and CEO now. Thank you. Forrest, welcome back. It's been a while, I feel like. Thank you, Zane. I'm Forrest Burt. I'm an HPC systems engineer here at CIQ. Thank you. So let's go ahead and dive right into it, guys. I want to first off just open it up and ask the question of somebody tell me the background of OpenHPC, kind of where it came from, what it is, where is it today? Sure, you want me to take that already. question? Absolutely. <laughs> I, was say, I do I actually you know just the person for that. Exactly. <laughs> um, let's see here. I haven't tried this before, but uh, let me share something. This might might be helpful. Uh, I like I said, I've not tried this before. We'll we'll see how. Uh, see what uh, ask you to see how this works questions. here. I'm just looking for. There we go. Um, make sure I got the right one there. And if everyone gets a chance to see that, um, so this gives you a quick background on an open HPC. Um, it's a reference collection of HPC software. Specifically, it is intended to be open source and architecture neutral. Um, I also like to view it as a, as a collection of, overall, I like to view it also as a software distribution. I mean, it's not low level like Linux, but what, what it does is on a basic Linux system, it's going to sit on top of it. It's going to provide a full collection of, of HPC software, including the provisioning system, as well as the resource management and most other components that are needed. And if I have, uh, I can't remember if we've got the timeline. I don't have the timeline handy. Um, but just a quick background. Uh, it was originally launched in 2015 um, with 1.0. Uh, the most recent update or major update was 2020 uh, when we launched 2.0 uh, supporting, uh, at the time, CentOS 8 and SLES 15, or uh, OpenSUSE 15, uh, it has now been uh, updated to support uh, Rocky 8. Uh, but that's a quick background. That's great. Thank yeah. you. So now one of the pieces that's involved in OpenHPC is Werewolf. So Greg created Werewolf a long time ago. I think we've talked about that before, but how, how does Werewolf fit in the OpenHPC world? Greg, I one thing feel like I, that's a question for you. Well, one thing I wanted to mention even before that is uh, early on, like when OpenHPC was just starting, I was on one of the technical, I think it was a technical steering committee. Jeremy, you may remember better than I do, mm -hmm. um, where in the organization. But I was brought in as a representative uh, from uh, Department of Energy and Berkeley Lab. Uh, and just interestingly, Gary was my boss at that point and approved my time to be spent <laughs> on OpenHPC and uh, and to help with the project. So, I mean, I go way back with the project as well. And I think I was invited in at that point uh, because of the 
the interest that OpenHPC had in leveraging Werewolf for that provisioning. And uh, so it's it's been it's been fantastic to kind of you know, been part of the project early on, and then again just kind of watch it just take off and continue on. So um, very very cool. Now Zane um, completely forgot at this point what your question was. Oh, you I was asking me? how does Werewolf fit in with OpenHPC? Like, what role does it play in in that stack? Ah, oh, I accidentally just kind of touched on it. Or yeah, you did. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, Werewolf is. Um, an operating system provisioning and management platform uh, specifically for clusters. Uh, it was built around the idea of high performance clusters, making it real efficient for system administrators and engineers to build and manage their systems. Uh, there are people using it outside of HPC, but HPC is definitely its dominant use case. Um, Open HPC has leveraged Werewolf as uh, I'd say the primary or one of the primary provisioning um, solutions that it uses within uh, OpenHPC. And, um, and it's been really focused on Werewolf version three for pretty much the whole life of, of OpenHPC. And uh, more recently, we've started building towards Werewolf version four. And uh, so I think in this conversation, we're gonna touch a little bit on Werewolf version three versus, versus four the benefits there and um, and maybe even kind of where the open HPC direction there. Um, but uh, but that's really where it's focusing within a open HPC. Open HPC has a plethora of different libraries and applications and, um, and, and middleware and solutions really to make turnkey HPC as easy and reproducible as possible. And they've done an absolutely fantastic job at that. And again, Werewolf is really just sitting on the how do we help provision and, and manage those images on compute nodes? So I think one of the things we hear quite often when we talk about Werewolf is images. And just real quick, Jonathan, how does Werewolf handle portability and flexibility of node images? So th this is something that's changed and in my opinion, drastically improved uh, even over uh, other previous versions of Werewolf. So historically, you've created kind of a special directory, a true directory that you've installed packages into and kind of handled it manually up front. And then you could shell into that image and, and make changes to it similarly to how you would if you were SSHing or otherwise logging into a system and making changes to it and then distributing that image to other nodes. Uh, Werewolf 4 um, refactors this uh, partly through vocabulary, but also through a little bit of, of integration on top of the semantics that have come up through the Open Container Initiative uh, through the Docker project and, and similar things. And so now, rather than having to, you still can, but rather than having to create that uh, node image from scratch by hand, you can initialize it from an, ups an upstream OCI container uh, through a registry or through a, an image that you bring with you. and. To, to my mind, that makes the whole thing make a lot more sense. You can start from that and then continue to shell into the image and modify it the way, you know, if, you, if you've used previous versions of Werewolf or other similar systems, you can keep doing that. Or you can do what I prefer and never change that image. Just uh, keep modifying your container, your container definition file, and then you can keep that in Git or some other uh, revision control system. And in that way, uh, track the the version history and the changes to that image over time without having to keep track of this big binary blob or special directory that contains your image. That's great. Thank you. Misha, I'm going to pick on you next because I know that you're actually going through this right now. You're yes. currently a Werewolf 3 user in your environment and you're in the process of going through that change over to 4. So I guess the question is how different are they in your mind? So uh, I think uh, Werewolf 4 has been a great work compared to Werewolf 3 in terms of how to manage the uh, provisioning. Um, uh, Werewolf 3 had some issues for us. Uh, one of the big issues was the database, that you need to keep everything in the big database. And you have to keep those blobs, like gigabytes of blobs in the database and even extracting data out of them and shoot those images to the nodes was kind of like a pain for us sometimes, not always. 
but I think the new design is is a game changer at this point because we're not going to have that big database. We're going to have a brand new way of seeing the uh, containers, which used to be a VNFS things in a uh, World War Three. And moving towards container, I guess it's a whole better idea, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, that you can have a track of things that you have done inside your container. Now, the big problem we currently have is we have uh, too many images for different systems for provisioning. And after a year and a half, we exactly don't know what's going on in those images. So we didn't have a good documentation. Sometimes people just keep adding stuff into the image fixing things inside the image, there is no track of them. Now, I think having a good Docker recipe and then keep it somewhere for your organization uh, or your institute and and try to get that recipe for you every time, that's the best way actually you can track because if you're gone, the next person can pick up and work on it. Now, we haven't done it yet. We haven't moved to Wearable 4. We're still working. Uh, Jonathan is helping us at this point. So hopefully, within uh, uh, we're targeting the end of this year to fully move to Wearable 4 um, and all the nodes in, in our cluster provisioning from Wearable 4. That's great. Thank you, Misha. Gary, I've seen you nodding your head to a lot of this. I know that you've had experience with with Werewolf 3 as well. So what do you see as the differences and how is that impacting you? Well, you, you know, um, what I'm going to say is we're, we we haven't used Werewolf 4 yet, um, but we're, I, I would say we are at Werewolf 3 and a half. And thanks to Greg, because since Greg was at the, at the laboratory, we saw a lot of the early thinking for Werewolf 4 in, in, in our version of Werewolf. And so someone was mentioning, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, the way you would, you know, CD into this directory and build your BNFS. You know, early on, we uh, realized that um, that only the person who did all that work understood what was in that build, and so we really had no way of reproducing it in a in in a easy way. Uh, so uh, when Singularity came along, that uh, Greg invented too, then uh, we started using Singularity to manage our builds. So it was kind of like a early form of using containers to manage our VNFS builds. So um, so that that we we still do it that way. So it's almost like a precursor to I believe what what we will be seeing in Werewolf Four. We're looking forward to that. Great, thank you. Jeremy, from the OpenHPC perspective, what do you see the difference or how have they impacted you? Oh, can't hear you anymore. Sorry, Jeremy. There we go. Off mute. Sorry there about that. Um, so the first, the first major change uh, I, I think came in when we were doing some internal migration to uh, uh, OpenSUSE 15.4. Um, there were some changes in the structure of, or there were some changes in the way uh, uh, OpenSUSE 15.4 compresses uh, the modules. And it's not compatible with Werewolf 3. Werewolf 3, in its underlying structure, requires this intermediate boot layer. And that boot layer has to, by design, be able to support the operating system that it's, that it's booting. Uh, the beauty of Werewolf 4 is it jumps directly into booting the operating system so we can bypass all of those requirements and everything works great. And so uh, internally, there is a, a move and a push, even before it was available in OpenHPC, to move into uh, using Werewolf 4 because it has uh, a lot more capabilities. So in the uh, recent uh, TSC, um, two weeks ago, we had a discussion on, on Werewolf 4. Um, it is going to be moved into um, it'll move in, it'll move into factory first. Uh, in fact, I just put in a new uh, PR for a uh, an updated build yesterday to include the uh, the four three source plus a few patches from uh, commits, and so I expect that to be go up to to be available relatively soon. Um, but the answer to the question is, there's two options that we have if we continue supporting 
uh, Susie, either we have to update Werewolf 3 or we have to move to Werewolf 4. And I think the, the clear the clear channels move to Werewolf 4. Great. Thank you. Glenn, you've been playing with this lately in some interesting ways and kind of getting back integrated with it and playing with it. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> Yeah, it's a it's a big step up from uh, from three to four, um, as Jeremy and others have mentioned that the uh, being able to have a, a Docker file for your container as opposed to just creating a chroot and there's no record of what per people have put into the chroot, you know, for example, to to know what's in there. Um, I think that's a it's a, a huge huge step forward and um, as Jeremy mentioned too, there's no shim, right? So you could it just you know, boots up your, you know, your kernel and your and your and your file system right away in a, in a stateless manner. So uh, it's a little bit more agile, uh, a little bit quicker booting, and um, yeah, uh, and so a little a little bit more streamlined. I, I think it's uh, a, a really good, a really good step in that direction. And I've been able to use it with uh, uh, with Ubuntu and Debian and you know a bunch of distros. So it's it's been really good. It's great, thank you, Forrest. I'll come to you last on this question. They've been playing with this for a while as well. Yeah, I've looked into it a little bit. Um, I would say that for the most part, I'm excited about what Glenn is similarly excited about. Um, I really like the reproducibility of the container being a central focus of it now. Um, beforehand, as you mentioned with truths and stuff, it could be a little bit difficult to keep track of exactly what went into that. Um, and that's you know something common that we talk about with those sandbox type containers that you could have some original definition, but then as you make modifications to it, those could be potentially lost. So I think that, you know, with one of the main goals of containers and that type of thing being reproducibility, um, one thing that I'm most excited about there is, yeah, the ability to integrate just containers from definition files directly um, so that that can all be tracked a little bit better. Great. Thank you. And I think we touched on quite a bit of what to be excited about. But Jonathan, I know there's one thing that's really interesting and that you touched on a little bit or someone did, but talking about overlays, can you kind of explain that a little bit, a little bit deeper? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those things. So th the fact is I had heard of Werewolf before, you know, before I came to CIQ, I was familiar with Werewolf 3. It was something that a past colleague of mine had mentioned, but I'd never really used it. And when I, so my first kind of hands on with it was with Werewolf 4. And I, I don't even know how to imagine running a system without the overlay system from Werewolf 4. And then even 4.3, I came in right before 4.3 was released where you could take, so I'll, I'll back up a moment. So overlays allow you to bundle up configuration files uh, into, they end up getting compressed into an image that gets shipped across to the node uh, to customize your, your node's state at boot time and then separately um, on on some kind of interval by default it's once a minute and you can have different overlays for different nodes different groups of nodes uh, and in 4.3 you can have multiple overlays that kind of get layered and concatenated together rather than having to have a single overlay image that goes to a given node and this just makes configuration management such as it is in an image-based system just really, and Glenn said earlier, really agile, really straightforward. It just kind of does what you want. Um, and it's it's been really great to have access to. Um, I, I know there was, you know, a way to do this before, uh, but the, the one that's in Werewolf 4 and especially 4.3 is just so flexible and, and really easy to express the kinds of things that you're likely to want to do in a clustered environment like this. It's great. So Greg, the kernel question comes up quite often about kernels, different versions of OSs on things. So can you talk to me a little bit about how how easy or difficult is it to deal with kernels in Werewolf 4? So let me start on this in, in a little bit of, I'm going to start actually with Werewolf 3. So Werewolf 3 and every version of Werewolf previous uh, handled the node provisioning in two parts. It, there was the, the the operating system, like the runtime user space portion of the operating system. And then there was the bootstrap. Now the bootstrap is basically the kernel and the initial RAM disk and initial kernel drivers that you need to kind of get the stack up and running. But that was all kind of tied to um, tied to everything. But but that was the kernel and um, and that bootstrap. Now 
you kind of had to play this mix and match game between what kernel are you running, what drivers are in there, and what is your user space going to sync up to or match against? So this gets really complicated when you start thinking about things like GPU stacks and you start thinking about Luster uh, and, and, and other things. You know, whenever you have a kernel component and a user component that has to match, you actually had to do this kind of by hand in, in previous versions of Wolf. Now, Werewolf 4.0, 4.1, and I think even 4.2 all did it exactly the same way as as everything did in the past right we had a bootstrap uh and or kernel and then we had uh our user space component of the of the operating system this made it very again difficult to go in and just install like gpu drivers because uh, you had to install the user space component into your into your your user space you know portion of the stack the container or the vnfs and do it on the in the kernel as well so again very kind of disjoint werewolf 4.3 changed that to the point where the entire kernel stack exists within that container. So this is really important as we start thinking about, especially in my mind, things like OpenHPC. OpenHPC includes uh, GPU drivers, uh, it includes Luster, and includes other facets that you wanna make sure that you're managing kind of a uh, close relationship between the kernel and your user space. Now, with, with Werewolf 4, we've talked about this a little bit. There's some key differences. If you're already used to playing with Werewolf 3 and you've been using Werewolf 3 or previous version, uh, there's some key differences. And one of those key differences is uh, we, we've kind of swapped out the notion of the virtual node file system, the VNFS, for a container. So this means, and we've touched on this a little bit here, so this means that we can basically take you know, a Docker file, a Singularity, or an Apptainer recipe, or whatever, build a container, then import that into Werewolf. So that container build process could be manual, could be a Charoot if you want, or it could be coming out of a CI CD process where you're constantly managing and, and uh, controlling who has access to that, what's going in there, and you can share it between many systems. So OpenHPC, and one of the visions that, that I originally had with this, and Jeremy and I were ta I've talked about this now for I think years at this point, Jeremy, is how do we take, uh, whether that be open HPC, whether that be a custom image, whether that be this image that somebody can expand, but how do we take that image and make it as easy as possible to get it out to compute nodes? So with Werewolf 4, you can literally just import the open HPC container. It includes the kernel, it includes the kernel drivers, it includes your GPU stack, it includes Luster if you wish, everything you need. You just import it directly into Werewolf, and then you literally just start telling, okay, I want this node to run OpenHPC, this OpenHPC container. I want this node to run that, this node to run it. Or you can say, I want this thousand nodes to run it and change it in just one configuration. Um, real quick as well, I mean, the, the, the configuration for Werewolf has also changed. It used to be in a database. Uh, this has now come up, I, I think, at least once or twice that we've kind of alluded. Um, now it's in a YAML configuration file. Uh, and we've we've been able to scale out that YAML configuration file um, to north of 10,000 nodes just to make sure that it was a scalable uh, interface for that. Now, if anyone's running 10,000 nodes with a single Werewolf controller on a flat broadcast domain, I think your network team would probably like to have speaks with you. Well, why, why? That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> until it's not <laughs> yeah exactly so misha i know you're going through this right now and kind of like greg said you're, you're moving from three to four and things are are different and trying to make it easier what parts of that are you looking forward to being able to do other than just getting away from the database i mean are you going to have those multiple images is that something that, that you're going to utilize oh yeah so a couple of things which is kind of very important at this point Migrating from Werewolf 3 to 4 is a very big process. Uh, and you have to consider that your, your, your system is actually under production. And you cannot have Werewolf 3 and 4 on the same system and even on the same network. That's what I learned recently that we have to kind of like, there is a conflict between the DHCP on, on two different nodes if you want to run Werewolf 3 and 4. And you should be able to manage that. Now, the things that we're looking forward at this point is to come up with the uh, right design and implementation of 
the new wearable four on our system. And then we have to start building new images for different systems. And the reason we need different images is because we have different networks. And sometimes uh, we have different architectures. And because of that, you have to build um, some of the drivers, install some of the drivers for Omnipath is different from InfiniBand, for instance, and you need different images for that. Um, and that that requires us to have a plan ahead of time. And and migration from Werewolf 3 to 4 um, is a long, is a kind of like tedious job to do. So we have to make sure that we're not mess we're not messing up with, with any services on the system at this point. That's right. Thank you, Misha. So Jeremy, on, on open HPC, I mean I know there's a lot of things that are coming now, but what yeah. else can we expect to see come out of the open HPC or what things are you really focused on right now in that environment or in that uh, that project? Uh, so I'm a, I'm focused on a couple things. And uh, the main one actually is is Werewolf 4. Um, and I'm also looking at updates to uh, overall to support uh, the new uh, latest OpenSUSE builds. Uh, so in terms of what uh, is available, that would actually be a good uh, uh, good discussion. I wish I had some had some slide decks talking about some of the things that are coming out. But um, in the next builds will typically be updates to uh, support the latest uh, operating systems. Um, like I said, one of the pushes I'm certainly making is to support OpenSUSE 15.4 because it has been out for a while. Uh, we also had an agreement to move the tool chain from um, what is currently GCC 9.4 or 9.5. Uh, that be that will be moving to 12.1. Um, so there's definitely some, there's a couple updates coming out. Um, one of the things before, uh, on a, on a side note, one of the things I actually want to talk about when we're still talking about the, the migration from World three to four yeah. and, uh, we haven't touched on it and that is security. Um, one of the, I think one of the key elements that we added with Werewolf four is the ability to secure your, um, provisioning system. Cause this has always been kind of a, a sore point with, with Werewolf three, um, being fairly open for other systems to uh, to get in. Um, but there's a couple of specific features that were added to Werewolf 3, including the ability to basically wait for a, uh, um, you could actually store a, um, a, Greg could explain this better. You can store a, uh, uh, the ability for uh, uh, Werewolf 4 to look for specific um, information coming from the node before it'll actually send a, send an image down to it. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking forward to is using World 4 because of the, the, the additional security features. No, that's great. Now, Greg, I mean, if you want to dive in a little bit on and talk about security in World 4, I guess that is something that I just kind of glossed right over and didn't even, didn't even bring up. So I think that's important. This has been a general problem of provisioning systems since, I think, forever, uh, which has basically been if you can pixie boot a node and that node can start pulling all of the necessary bits, layers, and information and configurations from a control system, then what is stopping a user from doing that? And if the user can do that, is there any material that we are sharing with the compute nodes from the control node that could be controlled? Um, anything or should be controlled, I should say. Uh, anything that might give them the ability to gain insights or or data on how to exploit and gain privilege within that system. So Werewolf 4 actually does a couple of things, you know, fairly different. The way that people typically manage this, by the way, is they have an out-of-band provisioning network. And they use that out-of-band network just for provisioning and management. And when the, the, the node operating system comes completely up, that, that uh, network is not available. Uh, it's either VLAN off or it's not configured and you actually have to get to root to actually you know, set up that network. But if the users are not root, they can't ever do that. So you kind of end up with this, um, this, this level of security that requires root to get root. 
so usually, usually that's good enough, but not all systems and not all architectures um, are capable of building out of band provisioning a network or fabric. Uh, so we wanted to do some things that uh, further enabled the security uh, and made it so the only way you can actually get this data, get the provisioning data configurations and whatnot for your node is if there is some sort of you know, secret key uh, that we can leverage on the hardware. And we ended up using uh, asset keys for this. And so most platforms support asset keys and you can put in a freeform string in your firmware of your system for an asset key uh, or leverage the, a random asset key for that, can add that to the Werewolf configuration and Werewolf will only hand out those bits if those asset keys match. And now a user who's SSHing and coming into the system without physical access cannot actually get to the BIOS of those systems and don't have root, won't be able to get those um, asset keys. So this gives it this gives us a level of protection, which honestly in provisioning we have not really had before, at least not in Werewolf. Oh, that's great. So I, I want to, Gary, I saw you shaking your head again on some of that. And I think security is an important aspect. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about, from your perspective, the security around provisioning. Um, you, you know, that it's, um, we're glad to see that addressed. Uh, we, we actually, we weren't all that concerned of the fact that somebody, if they knew that obscure path, could get that data off the master node. Uh, until we uh, recently put into production a uh, secure uh, computing and research uh, data platform for the for the university, which will handle PII and HIPAA data, and and then when we had an outside firm come in to do the um, uh, evaluation to do the uh, certification to 800171, which is a uh, uh, an NIST uh, standard for sensitive data. Um, then it became an issue. And so we had to figure out a workaround for that. So the fact that we would be able to not worry about that with Werewolf 4 is going to be great. Great. Thank you. So Jonathan, I'm going to pick on you again, because you've been playing with this quite often later, quite a bit lately. And just kind of from a, how you've been dealing with it and playing with it, can you just give me what you see coming and kind of a I don't know, open it up and let you guys talk about whatever you want to. What are you, what has this been fun for you to deal with? I don't know that. I, I don't know that it's kind of broad. Um, it is broad. <laughs> I, 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 I think werewolf four is great and I've been trying to get more people to use it. So uh, I, I think that, you know, broad applicability in the, the HPC space and especially the academic HPC space where I come up, I, I can't imagine wanting to do uh, HPC provisioning with a different tool right now. It really does seem like the best, uh, the best of breed. Um, but I, I see opportunity for it outside of that as well. I've been thinking a lot about um, provisioning storage clusters in particular uh, with Werewolf. Um, and uh, I forget if it was mentioned here, but we've been talking a little bit about what it would look like to provision luster systems with it. And I have experience with BGFS in the back as well. I'd be, be interested in trying to, to spin up that kind of a cluster um, with Werewolf, but uh, also just putting up libraries of, of starter containers. And uh, so, you know, the work to create that container file is pretty minimal, and especially working off of the examples that are already available in the Werewolf, um, uh, in the Werewolf Docker Hub kind of space or account or whatever, you can see how we did that with Rocky and and kind of replicate those experiences with your own container. But there's no reason why we couldn't start putting up different versions of containers. I have a, a small uh, pile of containers to support like the Mellanox OFED and InfiniBand using the built-in support with Rocky and supporting OmniPath, that kind of thing. Um, the ability to replicate those experiences go beyond just your own ability to replicate what you did locally. Once you can replicate it, someone else can too. And uh, I, I think there's, as the community grows, and I think that'll only uh, only happen uh, more quickly when Werewolf 4 shows up in, in OpenHPC, more people will be using it and there will be more opportunity to share containers that people have had success with. And I'm hopeful 
that we'll find a way to do that with uh, with overlays as well. Um, there's there's nothing in Werewolf for that right now, but I think as we see that system become packages of things that can kind of be, be composed together, um, we might see a use case for being able to to grab those out and export them and import them too. I have, I have a, something I want to jump in with real quick. Oh, I, I didn't mean to cut off the question, um, but uh, I, I, I am kind of, you know, excited about what this looks like now to provision systems, to provision open HPC systems or anything is the, the one process that you could use uh, is you, you go install whatever OS you want as your controller kind of main operating system. You install Werewolf into that. At some point, hopefully, we'll get into Apple and, and other things as well. So it's super easy to do. And then you just start importing containers. So imagine if you want to go build an open HPC system, you just go and import the open HPC container from their documentation. They're like, here's our string. Here's the container. It's pre-made. If you're running this architecture, here's one. If you want to, you know, here are all the different variants of open HPC that you can choose from, whether you're doing a, a IO node, whether you're doing a controller node, whether you're doing a, a compute node. Uh, you can now go and just select the images that you want, or you can use other images that other sites uh, may have been basing on. And you can just leverage that. You can import that into Werewolf. You configure your nodes in, at the Werewolf command line, at the WWCTL command. Uh, configure things like your, your IP addressing, your nodes, um, uh, any other information you want with those nodes, um, et cetera. Configure your overlay if you need. The default overlay will probably work fine for pretty much everything that you need to run. And you just go turn those nodes on. And within literally minutes, uh, you know, with a quick how-to, you can actually be, be setting up and running your, your cluster. Now, we've done this at Berkeley Lab uh, with, with a number of clusters. And, you know, there's one story, everybody, everybody, I think who knows me knows I like to tell stories. There's, there's this story, um, of, you know, we built in this, this, uh, geophysics clusters a while ago, we built up this geophysics cluster and, um, I don't remember how many nodes it was, but it, for, for the day and age, it was a good size system. I think it was like six or seven racks or something of, of, of compute. It was a good size. System. And, um, we were integrating this and we had, we had Dell there, we had the NCSA there and we had all these people there and whatnot. And we first validated using the standard image that, that Dell and NCSA wanted to leverage. And it took us, uh, I think two days to get the software stack up, to get everything running. And we validated it so we can, um, get the system approved. And, um, and then we said, okay, well, let's go, let's go now respin this using our supported OS. And everyone's like, well, we, we can't stay for too long. So we got to rush. And it's like, oh, this won't take long. It's like, but, our, but our plane leaves in another like, you know, we got to leave here in like another hour. It's like, yeah, this won't take that long. And I, I think within the hour, we not only had the whole system reinstalled, reprovisioned using our standard stack that we're using everywhere else in a completely supportable way, but we actually ran the scientific code as well and validated it. And the funny thing was, is we actually got better performance. And... Um, you put this whole thing together and it was just like, it was so, and from that point on, actually, we had a great relationship with Dell and the NCSA and, and everybody else that was there to watch this. Um, but that's the kind of experience we really want everyone to be able to see and, and be able to leverage. And um, uh, I mean, imagine to be able to say, I want an open HPC cluster, or I want this cluster, or I already have this cluster running, but you know what? I'm going to go check out open HPC. Imagine that you can do that within minutes and reprovision your fabric, reprovision your stuff and, and test out different node images, test out different operating systems for upgrades. You know, we're, you know, uh, enterprise Linux, you know, 8.6 for here, but nine just came out. We're going to go try Rocky nine. Um, and you can import that image. You can add in all your overlays, add in everything you want on top of that image. And literally, it's just, okay, well, I'm going to go reboot, you know, these five nodes with it and go start testing some jobs with those five nodes. And, um, and you can actually start testing and validating this uh, in, a, in a very sane way. So that's kind of some of the benefits that Werewolf offers. And I think that the synergy between Werewolf and OpenHPC is going to make just the idea of turnkey HPC, which is kind of the whole thread of what we've been talking about in these uh, 
you know, research computing roundtables, uh, I, I think it's really just going to make that whole um, turnkey approach and turnkey aspect just so easy for people to deal with and to get solid, reproducible systems that have everything you need on it that you can just go and, and run with it. Anyway, there's my there's my big spiel. Jeremy, was I totally off on like what we could do with open HPC? I mean, I know we've talked about this. Kind of I, I, it's close. Yeah, no, we can we can do quite a bit. We've got we have open HPC running. In fact, I was when you were talking about the speed at which Werewolf 4 can operate. Um, and I something I never thought of doing, uh, but we've test we tested it internally, and uh, we actually have systems set up where we template we templated the image. So we have a base node image that operates as a template. And when a job is submitted, it takes that template, copies it, updates it, and sends that out to the compute nodes. And when that job's done, the whole, not only is not only are the nodes cleaned off, but the entire uh, node image itself is wiped out. <laughs> um, but you can replicate and update that node and it happens in less than a minute. I, I, I wanted to jump in with something. Absolutely, Gary. Yeah, you, you, about Greg's story, you know, I was there. The, the whole thing happened exactly like he said. Um, the uh, the interesting thing that I, I just wanted to emphasize is the reason why we did it twice, once with the Dell stack and once with uh, Werewolf, is because, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they buy or pro do procure clusters, um, if you say, well, I want this hardware, I, I want it this way, um, but we want to run our software stack when we want this level of performance. If they don't know what your software stack is, then the, a lot of times the vendors are going to be reluctant to say, give you uh, or do it, agree to an acceptance test using your stack uh, because they're not, a, not familiar with it. So in this particular case, we said, fine, well, why don't you qualify the hardware with your stack and we can make sure that that works out fine. And then we're going to roll our stack on it and then we can make sure that it works, you know, with ours. And so that, that was the reason for the back to back test. But it, uh, the fact that you can provision both uh, right next to each other uh, makes it so that you could do your acceptance and then you can go on from there. That's great. And before we throw up, I think Sylvie had a question before we throw it up, Jeremy, is there going to be, we've kind of alluded to a little bit about different, uh, container definitions is open HPC going to host some that, that you guys have as a defined, this is kind of the base that does this. And then you host those so that people can just go download them. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, it's something we should, we should look into. There is an open HPC con container project. Um, but that's a, it's a good question. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. That's great. Thank you. Now we can get to Sophie's question. So the question is, what operating systems can be provisioned with Werewolf? I know we've touched on several of them, but I will, uh, Jeremy, I will throw that back to you. Well, I have uh, I, I've personally <laughs> provisioned uh, CentOS, uh, Rocky, uh, Red Hat proper, Red, RHEL, uh, Slez, OpenSUSE. I know you can provision Ubuntu with it. Um, Question back. I don't know if anyone has experience with provisioning uh, uh, older version of CentOS, CentOS 7. I assume that it would work. Um, I think you can go, I think you have the ability to go quite a ways back. Uh, it's it's because of the nature of the way uh, Werewolf 4 is written, it should be fairly, it should have fairly broad support for most Linux distros. It's great. I know, Glenn, you've been, you've been touching some not typically what you would run across in a normal environment type operating systems lately. Yeah, I mean, if, there, if there's one thing that I'd like to see the community do more of, it's post uh, containers for, you know, Ubuntu or Debian or, you know, whatever distro they're working on, a, a place where we could gather all those because the, like the werewolf, uh, the werewolf containers um, are limited to like CentOS 8, 7 and Rocky 8. So we want to we want to get some more up there, but um, because the the adding the kernels to different distros, whether it's you know Ubuntu or or Rocky, uh, slightly different, you know, and getting the modules in there slightly different. So you know, just those things to smooth out those speed bumps for people would be, I think, would be uh, really helpful. Actually, I'd, I'd like to try things like you know, uh, Tiny Linux or Pi Pi Core or whatever, you know, all, all sorts of others really 
really different things to see if uh, if they would come up as well, just just for fun. You know, we learned something really interesting as part of this whole thing of trying to boot random containers up in like Docker Hub uh, is that most of the base containers have actually been rendered unable to boot uh, out of single user mode. So um, there's a core utils single users, a bunch of uh, system D stuff that has been turned off and, and optimized for container use. If you go and look at inside the werewolf source code, we got a directory right off root called containers uh, and then go into the Docker directory and you'll see like, look at the Rocky eight one. You'll see how many things we had to uh, change in terms of the default or the stream base container to, to get it to properly boot. Uh, so there's a couple interesting things there. So, uh, but being able to, I mean, the theory of being able to pull any container out of Docker hub and run that container on bare metal is actually pretty neat. Uh, and there's, again, there's just so much you can do with that, with that piece right there. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's what I, uh, that was the point I wanted to bring up there. Another great. Thank you. So this is a good question. So other than already running version three, are there any reasons to hold off on a werewolf four? And I know Misha, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. And I think one of the things that you're working through and looking at right now is the state full in version three versus stateless in version four. So something like that, I'll give you, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer that. And then I'll throw it up to everybody else. Well, actually there. I got a good answer from Jonathan a few days ago that we don't need state full anymore. So I think I'm pretty much convinced that stateless is going to work for us. Um, like I said, uh, there are a couple of things uh, that you need to consider when you move from Werewolf 3 to 4. The first thing is if you currently have a management node for your Werewolf 3, uh, you cannot install Werewolf 4 at the same time on the same node. So you need different node and you have to make sure that you're not going to mess with the network because the way that Werewolf 4 is handling the DHCP is different from Werewolf 3. That's what I learned so far. Now, because of that, uh, we have this on and off option of DHCP during the time that you want to provision a few nodes for the test. And once you make sure that everything is fine and you have to fully move to the Werewolf 4 to take care of the things for you, meanwhile, you have to make sure that you can handle the DHCP um, on both server nodes for, for your Werewolf, which they're hosting the Werewolf for you. There are a couple of other things that are going to happen when you move to the Werewolf 4. One of the thing is uh, uh, the uh, public and private key that Werewolf 3 generates for all the nodes uh, is going to be changed. It used to be, uh, I think, is it DSA or RSA 1024? It's going to move up to RSA 2049, I guess, which is a uh, kind of big change and more secure. So your previous keys are not going to work. You have to make sure that you have a brand new key uh, for the Werewolf 4. And uh, pretty much that's it. Now, there is one thing that I guess still you can do. Uh, Greg, you can correct me on that. If, you cur if, you, if currently you have any image that you shoot and then you make changes and then you create VNFS out of that, you can still import them into the Werewolf 4. It is possible. It's not, it, it doesn't have to be exactly the container. So you can bring in your old images into the Werewolf 4. But again, at some point, you probably want to move to the containers anyway. Yeah, so with Werewolf 4, you can just point it at a Chirrut directory or a VNFS directory. And, um, and import that into Werewolf 4. So it doesn't have to come from a container. It could come from an actual Chirrut. But you have to make sure that you have the kernel installed on the Chirrut. Uh, so have to is a strong word. Um, you should. <laughs> okay. um, you don't have to because Werewolf 4 does support the ability to do something called uh, kernel overrides. And this basically means that it can operate the same way that Werewolf 3 and previous versions did by overriding whatever kernel you may or may not have inside of your, your container or VNFS. It'll just override that and just say, ah, you just imported a kernel into Werewolf 4. I'm just, and you've configured that for a node. I'm just going to use that. It's very helpful for doing testing of different kernels, especially because you can import 
a kernel out of a different container. So let's say I've got container A and container B imported into Werewolf. Container A has a newer kernel that I want to test. I can actually take the, the kernel out of container A, import that into Werewolf, and then apply it to container B. So it's very, very, very flexible. Um, and not to make it sound confusing, um, there's just a lot you can do with it. So, so one of the, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. I, I wanted to to give one more point to the the question of is there any reason to hold off of of Werewolf four? And from a a functionality perspective, I I don't think so. I've actually had to go back for a another reason and install Werewolf three, and and going back has just been it, it, it's difficult to go back. Uh, but the one place where I do think Werewolf 4 has some deficiencies right now is in its documentation. There's been a lot of new features and a lot of new functionality added, even just between the different point releases of 4. And it's been easy for the website documentation especially to get out of date a bit. This is something that we're actively working on. And I, even I individually am actively working on uh, even today and yesterday. Uh, but with that, I think the werewolf community and the development community is a really good one to get involved with. I have never touched Golang before. Werewolf 4 is also a rewrite of the project in Golang. Um, but I found the, the code base as it exists to be pretty approachable uh, if you're any good at Googling what different programming semantics do uh, to find what you're looking for in the code and you know maybe offer some pull requests or help write some documentation if that's the uh, a way that you might be able to contribute. That's great. Thank you. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked looking for questions. Um, what I want to go back to, Jonathan, I know that you are, since you've been playing with it quite a bit, and I feel like I've picked on you a lot today, but I know when we look at the community and people giving back to the community, uh, yeah, there's the question right there. <laughs> how is that important? How should people, how should people go about it? Yeah, so, so, sorry, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, there's that. There's the werewolf.org. You can get involved with contributing to the open source project, which is hosted on GitHub under the HPC NG uh, account there. Uh, there's also a Slack team uh, for the HPC NG project uh, that most of the community werewolf commu uh, conversation takes place in. Um, but yeah, and anything else, Greg? I was basically going to say the same sort of thing. Uh, the community is extremely friendly. It's very helpful. We talk about a lot of things even more than just both. We talk about OpenHV, obviously. We talk about, you know, basically just how to build clusters, how to deal with clusters. And um, so the easiest way is just to join in the Slack, just take part of the conversations, join in, introduce yourself, uh, and, um, and go from there. The one I did want to mention, I wanted to give props out as well to Sousa. Uh, Sousa has just done such a remarkable job in terms of not only joining the community, but just being such an active uh, group within the community. Um, and it's been super helpful. So when we were talking about operating systems and whatnot and support, uh, Sousa, OpenSUSE, as well as uh, SLES, very, very well supported. Uh, inside of Werewolf. So it is not specific to a standard kind of enterprise Linux, Red Hat enterprise Linux type ecosystem. It is, you know, SUSE and SLES is absolutely supported. And again, they've done great. So, um, you know, Christian is, is one of the developers over there and is um, uh, now one of the Werewolf um, uh, committers, uh, like Jeremy and myself and others. One of the other things I want to yep. go back to that I have. Sorry. Go ahead. I just also want to, uh, uh, for anyone interested in uh, joining OpenHPC project, <laughs> um, openhpc.community. Uh, also check out our GitHub page. The wiki is uh, fairly extensive. And uh, you, again, you can join the project. You can, uh, if you have any OpenHPC open source uh, components you'd like to see added to it, there's a formal process for making that request. Uh, and we are consistently adding new new components to the, the to the system uh, or to the distribution um, and and for example and in every summer we have uh, uh, other projects we do like our summer internship projects so um, if you are interested in joining and becoming a developer for open HPC we would certainly appreciate it that'd be great and Jeremy we'll add those links to the bottom of okay thank you there they go 
one of the things I wanted to go back to before we run out of time here, we talked about stateless and stateful, and I think that comes up a lot on the conversations that I have. I think it's important to clarify stateful, stateless, and then it doesn't mean discless, right? Whomever. I'll, I'll let Jonathan or, or Greg, because they're the two that we've been talking with the most on these two topics. So, so yeah. So first of all, definitions, what we mean. Um, a, a stateful provisioning system. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is a system called Foreman. Uh, will usually do something like automate uh, a Red Hat Kickstart or I forget what Debian calls that, but something that automates the usual operating system installation process to lay an OS down on local disks, just like you would if you were uh, if you were installing it by hand, just automated. Uh, Werewolf is uh, an image-based uh, remote uh, stateless provisioning system. So you have that process having created an image and then ship it over the network at boot time and boot it. Um, there are sometimes, though, desires to have state with the node. And this is where I like to differentiate the idea of that provisioning process being stateless in that the thing that pro was provisioned is stateless and happens every time you boot the node um, from the node itself being stateless. Uh, so you could imagine, for example, one of the things we hear is that um, people want node logs to rot uh, be retained on the node uh, if they're not centralizing them through some other means. Maybe they want them to be retained on the node um, so that if a node crashes, they can bring that node back up and see the logs still on the node. They didn't get thrown away when the node rebooted. There's nothing preventing you from having a partition on a local disk on the node and part of what your stateless image does is mount that into the operating system so that logs get written to a local location. Uh, a, a, an even more straightforward use case in an HPC context might be having local storage resources that are available for maybe high IOPS workloads that don't need to be shared between nodes. You can mount some kind of local storage um, uh, onto a, a scratch path that users can write into that retains state on the node, even though the provisioning process itself is stateless. But then you can even still consider a stateless node that still has disks. So one of the concerns with stateless provisioning is that the operating system that comes across the wire is entirely held in memory. And there's a concern that that's eating into the compute cap capacity of your node because you don't have that memory available for compute workloads. Well, if you have disks in your node or an SSD or something, uh, you can create a swap partition and mount that swap partition. And that allows, as that memory is required, it allows the operating system to be flushed to swap, which is in inverted process from what you would normally do, but ends up in the same state that bits of your operating system are on storage, bits of it are in memory, depending on when it was last used. And all of the memory is returned for active use to the... Uh, um, to the running workload. So there's a lot of flexibility there and it doesn't have to look like putting an operating system down on the disk. Thank you for that, Jonathan. So we are actually up on time. I'm going to give everybody an option to give your closing thoughts or anything you want to add to this. Gary, I'll start with you again. Oh, we're really looking forward to Werewolf 4. So we're already making plans to do that. Great. Thank you for joining. Misha. I think uh, we're going to have a good result by the end of this year by showing some progress moving from Verbal 3 to Verbal 4. Uh, we're excited to look forward for that. That's great. Thank you, Misha. Glenn. Uh, just semantics. Stateful does not equal, uh, or stateless did not equal diskless, and uh, images did not equal containers. Very true. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, well, uh, with the uh, the work we put into World Four, I'm really looking uh, forward to its inclusion in OpenHPC, which should happen fairly soon. And uh, just a reminder: if you're attending Supercomputing, um, OpenHPC BOF, it will be will be there as well as the OpenHPC booth. And uh, I don't know if Werewolf's also having its own location, but uh, anyway, come out. Uh, uh, come look for us. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. Jonathan. 
Yeah, so I, I talked a lot about Werewolf today, but I'm also really excited about OpenHPC and being more involved in that community, which will only be bolstered by Werewolf 4 being part of it. Um, I've gained a lot of value from using the hard work that's come out of that project and not having to replicate it on my own. So thanks to everyone in that community. And if that's one that interests you, uh, definitely take a look at it. They're, they're doing good work. Thank you, Greg. I don't have much to say that hasn't been already said. I think this was a fantastic conversation. I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, for being part of this. Thank you. It's great. And Forrest, sorry we kind of made you be quiet in the corner. I'm sorry. No worries, Zane. <laughs> um, I'm just excited to see uh, Werewolf 4 uh, kind of come to wider adoption out in the market. Um, I'm excited to see how it'll end up improving the capabilities and capacity of OpenHPC in the end, and more broadly, uh, how it ends up improving the capabilities of the next generation of high-performance computing that we're all working on building. So, yep, very excited to see how it works. It's great. It's a great way to end. We really appreciate you guys joining. Thanks to the panel. Misha, thank you. Glad you were able to join for the first time. Looking forward to having you back again. Uh, Thank you for the interaction today. Thank you for the questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to hit us up if you have any more questions or if there's anything you would like help with. Go ahead and like and subscribe, and we will see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you.